fat-soluble vitamins. Let's first look at vitamin A. These are a family of compounds that include what are called retinoids. These include retinol, retinal, retinoic acid. The retinoids are the animal form of vitamin A. Then we have the vegetable form of vitamin A known as provitamin A or the precursor form. These are known as carotenoids. The one you may be most familiar with is beta carotene. There's actually a whole family, alpha, beta, gamma, delta carotenes, but the one that we are most familiar with is beta carotene. What you have here below is what we'll refer to as cocktail chatter. Right? What I'm simply showing you is that we have the animal form of vitamin A and the plant form of vitamin A ultimately forming the different retinol, retinal, and retinoic acid. They need to be in these forms before they can perform their functions in the body. And the main function we know that's associated with vitamin A is vision. Your parents tell you to eat your carrots so that you could see at night. Well, actually, that was a way to get you to eat your carrots because you have to be vitamin A deficient before you'll have problems with your vision. But if it got you to eat your carrots, yay. What's happening here is that you have light entering the eye. And there's a protein called rhodopsin that's involved in our ability to see. So this protein rhodopsin is made up of opsin and vitamin A. It's in the form of cis-retinal. You may recall we talked about cis and trans fatty acids. We have cis and trans retinol in the eye. And when light hits the eye, the cis form is changed into trans retinol. And this triggers a nerve impulse that carries the information to the brain that allows us to see. It's kind of cool. Other functions of vitamin A are that it's involved in the epithelial cells that line the internal and external surfaces of our body organs. And that includes the skin, the largest organ. Growth and reproduction. We look at the deficiencies and the toxicities. The major symptom associated with vitamin A deficiency is xerophthalmia. I'm going to ask you to remember the major deficiency conditions associated with these nutrients. You don't have to remember everything that's on these slides. It's a whole boatload of information, but what I'm asking you to know pretty much is the highlighted ones. A less severe form is night blindness. This is why I tell you, yes, you should eat your carrots, but unless you are vitamin A deficient, that night blindness will not be corrected. Vitamin A deficiency also affects growth of bone and teeth. Vitamin A is involved in normal vision, gene expression, reproduction, development of the embryo, epithelial cells, growth, and immune function. Toxicities include decreased bone density mineralization, headaches, nausea and vomiting, lack of coordination. But the one that I want you to remember is something called beta-carotinemia, and this is non-toxic. This is when you consume bags and bags of carrots because you think they're so good for you, and of course they are, but the beta carotene gets deposited in the fatty tissue of your skin and turns it orange. However, this is a non-toxic condition. You cannot overdose on the vegetable form of vitamin A. Toxicities are associated with the animal form, not the vegetable form. Food sources, animal sources include eggs, cheese, dairy products, liver, plant forms, the dark leafy vegetables, and the deep orange fruits and vegetables. And here's just a comparison. And you can see that you get a whole lot of vitamin A in the form of beta carotene in carrots and cooked spinach. Vitamin D is involved in regulation of calcium and phosphorus, two important minerals. What it does is it helps to increase bone mineralization, to improve bone density. 
Vitamin D also helps to absorb calcium from the intestine. Now you've heard that it's important to get sun in order to make vitamin D. That's because our body has the ability to synthesize vitamin D. This is the mechanism. When sunlight hits the skin, and that's what this is supposed to be. These are supposed to be skin cells, right? We have a chemical in our skin called dehydrocholesterol. When this ultraviolet hits the skin, that 7-dehydrocholesterol forms vitamin D3, and it travels from the skin to the liver, from the liver to the kidney, where the final form, calcitriol, is made. And it's in this form that vitamin D is involved in bone mineralization and increased absorption of calcium from the intestine. You don't need to know this series of reactions, but what I do want you to know is that the liver and the kidney are involved in vitamin D synthesis from the sun. There appears to be an epidemic of vitamin D deficiency in our country and perhaps around the world. We're not really sure what's causing this right now, whether it's avoiding the sun, whether we're evolving an increased need, but there's being a lot of attention paid to vitamin D levels. Deficiency of vitamin D causes a condition called rickets in children and osteomalacia in adults. We have a child growing and increasing in size, increasing in length of bones, but because they're not forming well, because adequate calcium and phosphorus is not being deposited in the matrix of the bone, the weight that's being put on the legs forces them to bow out. And that's what rickets is. It's this bowing of the legs due to inadequate vitamin D intake. Toxicity associated with vitamin D can affect the blood, the nervous system, the gastrointestinal system. Toxicity is usually associated with supplements. The recommendations are based on inadequate exposure to light. Sunlight is not implicated in toxicity. Skin cancer, yes. Vitamin D toxicity, no. And therein lies the conundrum. We get vitamin D from fortified products like milk, margarine, some cereals, eggs and fatty fish, and synthesis from the sun. I put in this map because folks that live below the 40th parallel can get adequate vitamin D from sun exposure, that being about 20 minutes a day. However, above the 40th parallel, where you're sitting right now, you don't get adequate exposure from the sun, uh, particularly between the months of September and March. So you need to drink your milk. Another comparison of vitamin D in food I have yet to recommend folks consume cod liver oil because they live north of the 40th parallel, but you can see that certainly would provide you with lots of vitamin D. Vitamin E are known as the tocopherols. It's a family of alpha, beta, gamma, delta tocopherols, and also what are called tocotrienols. The active form of vitamin A is believed to be the alpha tocopherol. Now, I don't usually talk about there being a difference between natural vitamins and synthetic vitamins. To me, ascorbic acid, whether it's in a vitamin pill or whether it's in an orange, is still the same as ascorbic acid, but that in an orange you get lots of other nutrients. However, in the case of vitamin E, there is a difference. We have what's called D-alpha-tocopherol and D-L-alpha-tocopherol. The difference between these two forms has to do with the electrochemistry. Suffice it to say that the DL-alpha tocopherol is 50% active as opposed to the D-alpha. Deficiencies with vitamin A result in a condition called hemolytic anemia. This is often found in premature infants. In adults, deficiency is not well characterized. It isn't seen very often. Vitamin E's functions include maintaining cell integrity, reducing oxidative stress. Vitamin E is an antioxidant vitamin. It's also involved in 
molecular function. Toxicities, pretty non-toxic vitamin here. Toxicity are usually associated with excessive intake of supplements. And what may happen is that there's an interference with vitamin K in blood clotting resulting in increased hemolysis or breakdown of red blood cells. Sources of vitamin E, nuts, seeds, oils. Nuts are my favorite. Again, a comparison. Vitamin K. As there are different forms of vitamin A, plant and animal forms, we also see that with vitamin K. There's what's called K1, which is found in plants, and K2, which you can get from animal sources, and we also make vitamin K in our body. The major function of vitamin K that you need to know is that it's involved in blood clotting. Let's look at this series of reactions here. We have these factors in our blood that are involved with clotting it, which is very important when you cut yourself, if you're having surgery. So there are a series of steps in the conversion of an inactive protein called prothrombin to thrombin. This involves both vitamin K and calcium. This active enzyme thrombin then converts something called fibrinogen into fibrin. And fibrin are these thin fibers hence the name fibrin, that come together to form that clot that you have on your wrist from scratching open a bug bite, but also involved in clotting in other parts of the body. You do not need to know this reaction. What I want you to know is that vitamin K is very important in blood clotting. Hence, a deficiency of vitamin K, in addition to affecting your heart, can aff affects your blood's ability to clot and can result in hemorrhage. Toxicities don't really know the upper limit for vitamin K hasn't really been shown to be toxic. It may interfere with anti-clotting medication and cause liver damage and jaundice in infants. Sources of vitamin K include green leafy vegetables, soy, and, and some plant oils. Vitamin K is made by bacteria in our gastrointestinal tract. When infants are born, they're given a shot of vitamin K because their intestinal tract is sterile. It's not until they begin to feed, whether it's through nursing or formula, that they introduce bacteria into the intestinal tract and it can begin to make vitamin K. Lots of K in spinach.